All right. Yeah, welcome everybody after the ECCV break to our um, TUM AI lecture series. Today, it's a pleasure to have Tara Pons-Moll here. Um, Tara is heading the research group at the Max Planck Institute that handles real virtual humans. So he's basically trying to digitize um, humans from real data. He's reconstructing them. He's tracking them. He's looking at cloth. He's looking at representations. So in short, he's, he's a pioneer in, in terms of how can we build digital replica of ourselves. And he has an amazing record um, in terms of his academic output. Um, he has published many, many top tier paper at both computer vision and computer graphics conferences, including CVPR, ECCV, ICCV, and SIGGRAPH. Um, and of course, also SIGGRAPH Asia. He's been awarded many, many times for his, for his works. And yeah, I could probably fairly say he's one of the leaders in the space. And we are very, very excited to hear about um, his very most recent uh, work about shape representations with implicit versus parametric meshes. And yeah, so you can just go ahead. Thanks. All right. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthias. I'm very excited to, um, to give this talk. As I was saying before, I changed my vacation plan so, I'm planned, so I'm officially still on vacation, but it's my last day. And I think it's a very nice way to get back to work. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, the introduction. Um, so today I want to talk about um, digital humans, but in particular, I want to focus on um, the kind of shape representations that are effective for learning. And in particular, I'm going to talk about parametric meshes versus implicit functions. So in our group, we're working um, towards digitization of humans, and we are interested in two goals that are interrelated. The first goal is on generation of people. And here we want to produce um, humans that look and move like real persons. Um, so the person that you see here um, hopefully looks realistic to you, uh, but it's just a, a replica of a, of a person is a digital human. And um, a good digital human should be um, also easy to control and easy to animate and importantly, easy to fit to data. Now, when it comes to modeling people without clothing, um, we have a good understanding on how to do it. Uh, but when it comes to modeling clothing, there's many open challenges. And this is because clothing comes in many different topologies, many different topologies um, and geometries and uh, appearances. And that makes the, the learning problem much um, harder, but also very interesting. So the other side of the problem is um, not generation, but perception. So this is given some input data that is missing in some respect. It might be noisy. It might be missing the depth dimension. We want to infer a three representation of, of what we're seeing, right? We want to make sense of, for example, pixels. And in computer vision, there's been a huge trend, um, let's say, like over the last um, 10 years, not, not the last two years, but over the last 10 years in detecting people in images or estimating their 2D key points or estimating their 3D key points. And I'm, I'm not interested in just these sparse representations. I'm interested in capturing everything that we see. And with this, I mean, um, I want to capture the geometry and I want to capture also the texture and um, illumination, personal details and um, and um, all these details that are important for, um, for perception. And as you can imagine, like these two goals are intertwined and uh, having a good generative model helps you um, perceive digital humans in images. And so these two goals should be um, addressed in, in, in simultaneously. Uh, it seems that my, uh, oh yeah, now it was stuck. Right, so one example of a, a digital human is um, the simple model. Maybe you've played with it or you have used it. And so here, um, what the simple model, what it uh, represents is the pose and shape of humans. And hopefully this looks realistic to you, but these are just synthesis of, um, of the model. And it models how people um, vary according to identity and according to shape. It's important to know that simple is based on, on a mesh and it's a parametric mesh based representation. And because I'm gonna use the terms pose and shape quite often over the talk, let me fix some notation and some concepts. Um, so the simple model is a function M that takes a set of um, uh, pose parameters, a pose code um, indicated here with theta and a shape code indicated here with beta, and it maps it to the three N um, or the N vertices of a, um, of a mesh. 
Now, Simple has been quite useful and to learn it, um, this is when I was a, a research scientist in Michael Black's group and we used a, a, a very uh, sophisticated 4D scanner, as you can see here, which consists of um, 66 cameras and um, projectors, LEDs. And what we did is we captured lots of people in different poses and shapes, and then we learned the model from it. And this was a very necessary step. And this, with this, we produce models that are um, very widely used in the community, which is very good. Um, but the problem is that, um, as you can imagine, this is difficult to scale. In particular, it's difficult to scale to the many different appearances of um, clothing, for example, or if you want to model, for example, human-human interaction or interaction with the three world, it's difficult to capture all these in a 4D scanner. And therefore, we need other solutions beyond that. We need that as well, but this is basically, I see it as the first step towards um, other solutions. So this does not scale immediately to the real world. And um, so we need other solutions. And here's how I see one can uh, address the problem. So we have models that go from pose and shape codes to a 3D world representation of, uh, of humans. And um, again, we want to add clothing. We have some works going into this direction, but it's still not clear what the correct representation for clothing should be. Um, and what is also important is to um, see which kinds of um, data sources we use for learning these models. One can use um, um, 3D scans or 4D scans. And in our experience, it's very important to start learning the models with a little bit of 3D data. But as I was saying, it's, it's not the only thing. It cannot be the only thing. Um, to scale to the, to, the, um, to the range of appearances of humans in, uh, in the world, we need perceive them from low-cost sensors, for example, from images that are ubiquitous in the internet. So here we want to um, relate the pixels to the model code somehow. Um, the problem is that this thing data is hard to obtain or almost impossible to obtain. If we had this data, we could just train a CNN, for example, to map from pixels to um, the three world representation, but this is not possible. But what is possible is to consider the images themselves. So you can create a loop here where you predict the model codes from the pixels, create a 3D world representation, and then render this 3D world representation into the, into the images themselves and use a self-supervised loss in order to learn both the perception module that goes from pixels to the 3D world and um, the generation model that goes from model codes to the 3D world. And the reason I'm so excited about this and others in the community also, including also the group at TUM, is that this includes, basically this paradigm includes components of um, computer vision, computer graphics, and learning. All right, so today I'm gonna focus on the representations and um, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about parametric mesh models. And then I'm gonna talk about implicit functions to represent shape. And I'm going to point out at the advantages, disadvantages of these two representations. And then if I have time, I will um, talk about a hybrid model that uses um, both representations. Good, let me start with parametric mesh models. So in this work, which we presented already two years ago, um, the goal was to extract a 3D digital human, including clothing and the texture from a single video of a person. So the person rotates, uh, rotates around um, him or herself. And the goal of the algorithm was to extract this 3D um, avatar. Uh, now there's many works addressing this problem, but it's fair to say that this was um, maybe the first work that showed that this was even possible from a single video. And of course, right now this year, we've seen um, results that are um, much more realistic than what I'm gonna show you now. So, but what kind of representation did we use here? Um, we used a representation that is based on the simple model that I described briefly at the beginning. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, I'll describe it now very quickly. So the simple model is based on um, learning a set of deformations that are applied in a canonical pose, in this case, a T pose. So basically you start with a mean shape, T mu, 
and you add a set of shape blend shapes, um, which model the shape identity. This is like model the differences between identity in a population. And they are parameterized by beta, which is the shape code. And then you have like post blend shapes that model things like muscle bulging, for example. And they, they are applied to this canonical pose before the articulated rotations are applied to the mesh. Right, so you apply the post blend shape such that when you apply the kinematic chain of rotations, you obtain a mesh that looks realistic. Right, and it's important to note that it's a parametric mesh model because it takes the pose and shape code and it maps it to um, the three end vertices of a mesh. Right, so it's a mesh based representation. So now the question is how do we add clothing to this? Because Simple was trained with only scans of people without clothing, it cannot represent clothing. So here we did the simplest thing that you can imagine, and it's adding another field, another offset field, um, to model the clothing, which is um, um, denoted as D, right? And this D um, represents also the facial and personal details and the clothing in a, as a single layer on top of simple. So basically how this would look like is you start with simple and you add this layer and you end up with um, a cloth um, representation. Right, so the model is more like the paper like showed an algorithm that is a little bit more sophisticated than what I'm going to describe, but just for the purposes of this talk, um, all we need to understand is that um, you have output codes, the pole, shape, and clothing represented as D, and essentially you optimize the output codes such that the 3D world representation, when rendered into the video, um, it matches the silhouettes well, right? So here we used um, a loss that is based on silhouette matching and also key point matching. And we optimized over a sequence, keeping the shape fixed for all the frames and optimizing the pose um, at every frame. Um, and in terms of representation, it's maybe surprising how far you can get with this simple offset displacement from simple. So these are some results that we obtained from single RGB videos. And notice that we can get different kinds of garments like short pants, long pants, and, and so on. And in also the texture, which is back projected from the images. Um, and the interesting thing is that because the model derives from the simple model, we can also change the shape and the postcode. So we, we obtain reconstructions that are then um, controllable and editable. Right, um, all the code that I'm gonna, uh, all the code of all the projects I'm going to present, you can find in our website or most of it. Um, yeah. So this representation, however, has some um, limitations. So the first one is that um, this is based on optimization, instance specific optimization. So as you know, it's prone to local minima and it's um, slow. Um, it's typically, let me put it this way, it's typically slow. And, um, and representing clothing as a single offset field is limiting because we cannot separate what is body from what is clothing and therefore we have limited control abilities. Right, so to address the first problem of local minima and bad initialization, we can um, resort to this self-supervised paradigm. So what we can do is not optimize the output codes directly, but optimize the parameters of a neural network that goes from pixels to these output codes. And so essentially now the optimization doesn't go over one instance, but it goes all over all instances of the training set. So now you have the pose, shape, and clothing codes parameterized with the neural network and the input observation. All right. So here you find three representative papers um, that exploit this paradigm. Um, I'd be very excited to explain any of the three papers, um, but because in this talk I want to talk about representations, I'm going to focus on the ICCB19, which is the only um, work of these three that can separate the body from the clothing, and I'm going to point out at what um, advantages and what difficulties come with it. Right, so in this work, which is called Multi-Garment Net, we presented this at ICCB19 last year, um, the goal is given a video of a person, or in particular here, we use only eight images of a person rotating around him or herself. We want to 3D reconstruct the person such that we get a 3D body shape and the garments separately. In a way that now if we have a target subject, 
um, as you can see here, which is wearing a different clothing, we can map the, the, the clothing of the source subject into the target subject, effectively dressing this person with the clothing of the source subject. So we want to obtain reconstructions that are um, flexible so that they allow us like also um, edit capabilities. So here we show another example. This is the input. Um, again, we use eight from one to eight images as input and we obtain a reconstruction that allows us to map just the clothing into a target um, subject, as you can see here. All right, so how do we have to change the representation? So if we use a single displacement field as before, it's obvious that this is not gonna work because we cannot separate what is body and what is clothing. Uh, so we need a way of basically segmenting out what is clothing, what is body. So here we um, basically resort to the re representation that we presented at cloth at CGraph 17. And um, the basic idea is to non-rigidly register the garments to the body such that you have a one-to-one -one correspondence. And why this is beneficial is because if you have a perfect registration between the clothing and the body, then you can do linear algebra literally with garments and bodies. And this is what I'm gonna show you here. So you get um, this displacement field, DG. This is a displacement field for the garment which is basically obtained as um, a garment geometry G, right? Which is shown here, minus the part of the body that corresponds to the garment, right? Which is um, selected with an indicator matrix I. And this, with this, you, you obtain a displacement field um, <clears throat> from the body to the garment. Now, given a new body shape, the cool thing about this is that I can take the target body shape which is um, represented here. I'm indicating this with my cursor. And we can add this displacement field in order to add clothing to this target shape, right? And notice the clothing comes from this source subject. We can do this from for the different garments. And this is quite powerful and it works also for dynamic sequences. Here on the left, you see a 4D scan of a person. We extract we estimate the body shape under clothing and we extract the garments and we map them to a target subject. Here, I'm not using any learning. It's just based on optimization and registration. Um, however, we need the 4D scan for, um, for this model that was called, called cloth cap, right? And this is only allowing us to get the, clo the clothing from one scan and mapping it into another scan. But in the ICC-19 paper, MGN, what we want to do is to, um, given images of a person, not a 4D scan, but even single images of a person, we want to get the same um, capabilities. And with this, like um, we presented this um, network that is called multi-garment net, which basically takes a set of input images of a person rotating around him or herself. And notice that these images um, they change in pose, which makes the reconstruction problem more challenging, but also more practical because you don't you can record with a single camera. Um, and basically, you have a neural network for each garment that predicts the garment geometry for every detected garment in the image. And you obtain a set of the geometry of the garments separately from the geometry of the body. The body is represented with simple, and the garments are represented as displacements from simple, which are segmented based on this cloth cap representation that I mentioned before. So now we have codes for clothing, for pose, and for shape. And this is basically the 3D world representation. And now if we want to learn this model, we need to supervise it. And one way to supervise it is by projecting the model itself into the images. And because now we have this separation, we can use a, a, a 2D segmentation loss to compare the, our prediction with the um, segmentation in the images, right? And this is, this is a basically a 2D supervised uh, model. And similarly, as with other papers, what we observed is that you need a little bit of 3D supervision in order, in order to get things running. So essentially, like we also have a 3D supervision on uh, the per vertex level, and we also have a little bit of supervision on the, um, on the codes themselves. Um, so what this allows you to do is to supervise the model with a little bit of 3D data and much more um, 2D data. Right, so 
the advantage of this model with respect to the previous one I presented or other models that have been presented um, um, recently is that it allows you to have more control. So you can have eight images of a person, which I'm showing you here, and you can reconstruct the garment separately from the body. And now you can map these garments to any body shape, as you can see here, um, which, which is possibly um, desirable in many applications. Right. This model, however, is mapping the clothing geometry, but it does not know how the clothing deforms when we move. And the clothing deforms non-rigidly when we move and is a very highly nonlinear function of shape, pose, and the material properties as well. So in this work, we, we presented at CBPR last year, which is called TaylorNet. Um, we are attempting to learn how clothing deforms as a function of the pose shape and also the style. So the first pair that you see here shows the same shape and two different styles. Notice that this um, t-shirt is longer here. Um, the second pair shows um, the same shape, but two different um, the same style, but uh, no, sorry, two styles on, a, on, a, on, a, on the same shape. And finally, we show that we can do this for different garments. So um, let me just show you the results. And if you're interested, we can discuss after the talk or you can ask me questions or you can um, check the paper. Uh, so what the model allows us to do is to control the style of the, of the garment. So we can change the sleeve length or the, length, the length of the of the, um, the t-shirt or pant or skirt model. And um, it also allows us to, um, uh, let me skip that. Um, it also allows us to see how a fixed um, garment of a particular style changes when I change the body shape. So what you're gonna see now is the body shape of the person changing and you can see how the fit of the garment to the body changes um, when the person moves. So we learned this model based on parametric in a parametric mesh representation as well. And here we use physics-based simulation um, to learn the model. Now you might ask, well, if the physics simulator already produces results, why, why do you want to learn a data-driven model with a neural network? And the reason is that the model is faster, is more reliable because when you run physics-based simulation, many times it breaks and you have to start it again and you have to fiddle with the parameters until you get good results. And, and essentially you end up with a model that maybe it's less general, but it's, you know how it will behave for the um, set of poses that, um, that I mean, if, if you have like a good training set, then you can um, obtain a model that, um, that generalizes to the poses um, that, that you want. Okay. And um, so this model, like what is surprising about this model is that um, it's trained only on static poses and it really generalizes to even motion sequences as you saw before. And um, yeah, I was actually quite surprised how well this model um, generalizes to different body shapes and poses. And the model and data is online. So if you're working on similar topics or you wanna um, work on this, I, I really recommend you check it out. All right. so. Um, so what are take home messages so far? Um, one take home message is that encoding the body separately from clothing allows you more control. Um, now we have codes for pose, shape and the clothing. And basically now the codes carry, carry like a meaning and allow um, control. Right, so it's interesting that in the 1950s, in the boom of information te technology, there was a discussion on how one should encode information. And one trend was um, that researchers were um, supporting the idea that codes should carry meaning or should carry, um, yes, like they should be interpretable by humans. Another group of researchers, um, and in particular, Claude Shannon, we're saying, well, never mind about meaning. I'm just going to model information source as a statistical process with messages of varying probabilities. Right? I'm going to assign less bits to more likely messages and um, and lengthier codes to um, less likely ones. Right? To minimize the uh, the total message length. And now there's a similar discussion on whether one should learn everything from data or one should incorporate a little bit of prior knowledge. 
And so I think these discussions are a little bit related. And in the first part of the talk, I've been arguing for adding more meaning or more control. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to discuss representations that are maybe more aligned with this learn everything philosophy, which brings advantages, but it also brings disadvantages. Right. So the remaining problem we have, even separating clothing from body, is that we still rely on this mesh based representation that is an offset from the body. And this means that if we want to model complex topologies and model, for example, scenes or general objects, we will be limited. Right, so in this second part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about implicit functions for representing shapes, which will allow us to generalize to different objects and more complex topologies. Right, so I'm sure that most of you are um, very familiar with the concept of an implicit function to represent shape, but just to fix some concepts, I'm gonna refresh um, your memory. So basically, you can represent a shape with an implicit function by defining a function that, that separates the inside of the surface. In this case, the surface is the blue region. Um, it separates the inside of the surface with the outside, right? So you can have um, a function f of p, which is an occupancy function that takes value 0 if the point p lies outside and take value 1 if the point p lies inside. And now if you want to recover the surface, the blue region, um, basically, you can find the decision boundary between the inside and the outside, right? Now, why would we use this representation as opposed to, for example, meshes? The main advantage is that you can track topology changes very easily. So if now the shape is split in two, as you can see here, all you need to do is to change this function f of p. And you can do this in a differentiable manner. If you were using a mesh to represent the surface, you would need to track like how nodes are um, like getting connected and disconnected. And it would, it, would, it would be also quite difficult to implement. So in my view, this is the main advantage that you can track topology changes and you're more flexible in the kind of representations, in the kinds of shapes that you can represent. Right, so last year at CBPR um, 19, um, three papers came up with the same idea at the same time. This was um, <clears throat> kind of um, a coincidence. And um, these papers were quite um, revolutionary in my view. And so what they were doing is um, given an input, right, which might be a sparse point cloud or a partial point cloud or some low resolution back voxels. They were mapping this input observation into a latent code Z. Um, and then like they were training a decoder such that uh, give, based on the latent code that encodes the information about the shape and the point, they were classifying the point as being inside or outside the surface. And basically, then you would query many points and then you would recover the, like, the shape using marching cubes afterwards. And the reason this is, like, um, is quite interesting is that you can choose the resolution at test time. So at test time, you can choose as many points as you, you can query as many points as you want, uh, which allows you to choose the resolution. It's quite, um, and also because it uses an implicit representation, um, you're quite flexible in the shapes that you can represent. Right, so these are some examples um, um, of these models, like the kind of shapes that they can represent, which is quite, um, yeah, the results were quite compelling because they are continuous and they can represent multiple topologies. However, we used it to reconstruct humans and we observed two main limitations. The first one is that they fail to reconstruct articulation and they fail to reconstruct um, detail. So sometimes the surfaces look rather over smooth and they don't contain a lot of um, detail. And in particular, they miss the detail that is in the input um, observation which is a pity. Right, let me explain what were our hypotheses and our solutions to these um, problems. So this is the um, architecture that I showed before of these papers. And basically the main problem, um, or one of the main problems is that first the latent code is like some n-dimensional vector, which is disconnected from the 3D world where this input is living. And so there's a loss of 3D structure by going from this input X to this latent code Z, which is disconnected. 
And the other problem is that this decoder is seeing the point coordinates, the X, Y, Z locations of the input um, to decode whether the point is inside or outside. And the problem is that point coordinates ca carry no information about um, local and global shape information. Okay, so how do we address these problems? Um, inst instead of decoding point locations, what we do is we 3D convolve the input representation, which might be point clouds or voxels or whatever you have as input. And we 3D convolve it in order to obtain a multi-scale grid of deep features. This multi-scale grid is this F1 until Fn, as you can see here. And now, basically, a point is basically um, um, encoded as the deep feature extracted at this point location in the multi-scale grid. So this way, we obtain F1 evaluated at P until Fn evaluated at P, obtaining a global and local um, shape description of, um, of this particular point. And now we train a decoder to classify the point as being inside or outside. And this is quite different because the point is not sent to the decoder, but rather the multi-scale, um, the deep feature extracted at that point is sent to the decoder. Right, so mathematically before we had a latent code, the previous papers had a latent code Z, and based on this latent code Z and a point, we were um, decoding into zero one. And now we have first multi-scale deep features extracted from the shape. And now we evaluate these multi-scale features at continuous point locations P, and we decode based on these deep features. So this works much more like a semantic segmentation network would work, right? It's based on a particular pixel, you extract the features that are local and global, and based on that, you make the decision. Right, so we um, evaluated the model on several tasks like super resolution, um, um, point cloud completion, and, and so on, on ShapeNet. And we obtained significantly um, better, much better results than previous works. Um, and this, this is also reflected numerically. Um, if we wanna discuss these numbers, we can do this afterwards. Uh, I'm gonna show you just the qualitative results. So here I'm showing you the input, which is in this case, a dense voxel input and the output should be uh, uh, like a detailed 3D mesh. And, um, and here we, I also show this sparse point cloud and the output should be the 3D mesh. So essentially these are previous works based also on implicit functions, Chen et al and Mescheder et al. And um, as you can see, our model reconstructs nicely the articulated structures, which is what was failing in the other models because of this point encoding. And um, it also retains nice detail um, in the output. Right, we can also use IF nets for reconstructing, um, like given a depth map or a partial point cloud, we can reconstruct the, um, the full surface. And what we wanted to observe here is that wherever you have detail in the input, you should retain it in the output. And wherever you do not have data at all that you have to do on a completion, you should get a shape that is reasonable. Unfortunately, this is not a generative model. It just produces a shape for the occluded parts that is um, reasonable, but it doesn't add um, new detail usually. All right, um, just a little bit of um, self-advertisement here. Uh, so we, we took this AFNet and we adapted it for texture and we sent the code to this challenge, um, which was organized by the University of uh, Luxembourg and Artec 3 d and um, we were quite happy that we won um, both the track on completing humans and general objects. Um, and so here are some results of this IFNet plus texture, um, which will come up as a workshop paper. This is an extension of the CBPR paper. Um, anyways, I'm showing you this because um, I think for, for the problems you're working on, like it's probably worth checking the code to see if it works for your problems. And um, yeah, you can contact us if, if it doesn't work or, or you have some questions. But in our experience, this is, it's quite simple and it, it produces results that are quite satisfying usually. All right, but we still have um, a problem. Let me see how much time. All right, we still have a problem. 
and is that um, because we're using an occupancy representation based on zero one or a sign distance field, other people like, for example, like the deep SDF and work by um, by your group use, uses sign distance fields as representation. The problem is that, that this is limited to watertight surfaces. So with this, you can only model surfaces that are um, closed. But if we want to model open manifolds and we want to model, for example, garments, then um, we cannot do that. Or we need to close the surfaces, which is usually a pain. Also, we cannot model functions like the ones I'm showing you here. And you cannot model objects that have inner structures, right? For example, a bus has like inside chairs, and then it becomes very difficult to know what is inside, what is outside. So surfaces that do not divide the space into two regions cannot be represented. And therefore, we need a different output representation for this. So what is our solution? Um, we're always striving for the simplest model that does the trick, so to say. And here, what we do is instead of um, predicting the inside outside um, representation, we predict the unsigned distance to the surface. So instead of predicting a signed distance, we predict the unsigned distance. It seems like a trivial trick, um, but there's some issues that need to be addressed. And um, the amount of surfaces that you can represent as output is much more. So basically now we are going to predict the unsigned distance. Um, so basically based on the same input representation, this is the same as IF nets. Um, we predict the distance um, for every point P to the closest point in the surface Q, right? So now how do we use this to actually do things that are useful like completing point clouds or um, super resolving voxel, voxels? Um, yeah. In terms of notation, I'm going to drop this multi-scale grid of deep features, f1 until fn, and compress it into f of p. But let's bear in mind that the input to the decoder is this multi-scale um, grid of deep features, as I described before. Right. So imagine we want to, um, for example, complete this um, like um, point cloud. And uh, what we can do is we train a decoder that predicts for every point in 3D space or 2D space, it predicts the distance to the closest point uh, in the surface. And now we recover the surface as the zero level set, the same way you would do with the signed distance field. However, now we cannot detect the sign flip to detect the zero level crossing. So we need to do different things, uh, but we have solutions for this. So one can visualize the gradient field, which looks away from the surface and one could follow the negative gradient direction for every point until you converge to the zero level set. That might be one solution. Um, but you can do even better because just based on the properties of the unsigned distance field, what you can do is take a point P and project it directly into the surface with the following formula, which says take the gradient, which should be unit norm because it's a distance field, and just scale it by the distance itself and like this, you project the point directly into the surface. So super simple. And now what you can do is like you can predict the unsigned distance field, sample lots of points around the surface, and project them all into the surface to obtain a dense point cloud. Now, why would you do this? So what are the advantages? For example, you can reconstruct shapes which have inside structures like cars. Um, here I'm showing you the reconstruction on the left of IF nets, which I showed you that was obtaining state-of-the-art results in shape net, but it cannot reconstruct the inside of the surface. And um, with this representation, you can reconstruct also the inside chairs and the wheel. And so you can have as much structure as you want that with this representation, you don't have problems. This is also shown here with this transparency visualization. And we also used it for reconstructing garments, for example. Um, here you see that given a, like a partial point cloud, we obtain um, the meshes by sampling lots of points, um, like at test time. And because it's an unsigned distance field, we can use rendering techniques and directly render the distance field using some modifications of um, sphere tracing. And, and the nice thing, observe that the surfaces are open. Right, These open surfaces you could not obtain with occupancies and you could not obtain with signed distance field. So very simple trick, but it brings a lot of benefits um, at the, in the end. 
um, yeah, so this is in review, but we're planning to put this um, on archive, hopefully in the next two weeks or so. Um, yeah, so you can also use it for um, um, 3D scenes. This might be particularly interesting to this group that does lots of cool things on 3D scene reconstruction. So on the left, you can see um, the point cloud, which is sparse. And on the right, you can see the dense, reconstructed dense um, point cloud. And and you can, you can also get a mesh out of this dense point cloud using classical algorithms. Um, what is important to note here is that this is not a model trained on one sim. So this is not like, for example, the Sidon model or, um, or, or NERF. This is basically um, trained on 34 scenes and this is testing on a new scene. So you can give any new scene that you want without retraining and you get these results. So this is an important difference um, to point out here. All right, um, let me see how, yes, so I'm not doing so well on time, so I'm gonna skip this. Um, I just wanna mention that you can use this actually for representing other things, like for example, manifolds, and we used it also for doing classical regression. And what is interesting is that now you can do multimodal regression. So for one X, you can have multiple Y outputs and it still um, works without averaging the outputs. Okay, so summarizing, what are the advantages and disadvantages of one versus two? So parametric meshes, they allow you more control and they have more meaning. So for, for example, for computer graphics applications, they are very suitable and they are compact, but they are not very good to represent many different topologies, not very good for representing details. And um, implicit functions are not good for control so far. And, uh, but, they are very good for representing many different shapes and they are good at retaining details. And perhaps even more importantly, they seem to be more compatible with learning. So in our experience, you get um, easier, better results with uh, implicit function-based reconstruction um, with respect to learning to predict meshes. All right, um, I don't have time to explain this last work. Um, just, uh, I'm gonna explain the basic idea. Um, so basically here, uh, we try to combine the best of both worlds. So given a point cloud, we train a model that is based on this IFnet and we call it now IPnet because it can do more. It can predict the body shape and their clothing and the body parts, and it can predict also the clothing as a surface. And we do this such that we can then do non-rigid registration of a parametric model, like the simple model, um, um, we can register the simple model to the shape under clothing part labels, um, such that at the end we obtain um, a registration and a body shape under clothing that is controllable. Uh, like, yeah, let me skip that. Um, yes, these are some of the results of the partial point cloud on the left, the body shape under clothing um, with the body part labels, which is predicted with this implicit function network. Right? It predicts the parts as a, as a field, right? Um, so for every point in 3D, you predict also the part um, label. And um, the main advantage of this is that now you have, at the end, you, you get from a point out the controllable model, right? So given a, a skeleton, you can um, animate the reconstruction just because you fit the registration afterwards. All right, and this also works for hands. So for example, here um, we're showing given this partial point cloud, we obtain um, the, the implicit reconstruction with the parts and also the mesh uh, output. Right, and just the last thing uh, I want to present very quickly, this will take one minute because it's based on the short video. Uh, I introduce our work. Oh, sorry, I would like to not to mute that. Concept. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so here, what we were trying to do is to get um, a pose and a shape code to control um, the output. But in this case, we don't want to handcraft it like we did it with a simple model, like uh, where we, dis we had to define the skeleton, we had to define the kind of object that we were modeling, in this case, humans or hands or faces. Here we want to, in an unsupervised manner, or let's say based on registrations, um, we want to extract pose and shape codes such that, um, yes, it gives you the same like control abilities as like a handcrafted model, but learn from data directly. 
And here, just uh, very quickly, this based on two basic ideas. The first one is that if the subject does not change, um, as you can see here, you have two subjects, no, sorry, the same subject in two different poses. One should be able to swap the shape codes and obtain the original shape. That seems logical because the shape code should not change too much. And then like mixing up, um, I'm not gonna explain this because I'm gonna confuse everyone now quickly, but the basic idea is that if you take, you mix up pose and shape codes and then you recombine them together, um, you should recover the original um, shape. So this is so to say, the post code should not carry information about shape and it's encoded with this self consistency constraint. And, um, oh, sorry. Let me move to here. Yeah, what, what, is, um, what is quite cool about this is that using these two very simple losses and using the AMAS data set, for example, what we do here is we get the pose of the mesh in the input. Again, we didn't specify what kind of object this was, no skeleton, nothing. Um, but it learns to, for example, map match the pose of the source to any of the shape um, um, sources that I'm showing you here, one, two, and three. So notice that the um, pose is matched. Uh, so you're transferring the pose to any of these models. And we also trained it for animals and it allows you to interpolate between um, different animals or change the pose of um, hands, for example. And also it works for, for faces. And um, because we didn't make any assumption about the object. All right, I'm gonna skip that in the interest of time. So in the end, one message I wanna um, send, and I think this um, probably resonates with uh, the work you guys are doing, um, is that we used to think of machine learning as a tool for computer vision and graphics, uh, but I'm seeing it more and more as these three components as a one integrated thing, maybe also including robotics. Um, so I see vision and graphics as becoming an integral part of machine learning, because if you wanna learn models of um, that can perceive the world around us, that more and more these classical um, geometry and um, vision and graphics um, techniques can be integrated into the um, neural networks. And this is, um, is proven to be very, very effective. All right, so now coming to conclusions. Um, I've been arguing that for realism, we need to learn digital humans by capturing real ones. In our group, we focus a lot on modeling clothing because it's a complex. We also are starting to focus on producing semi-autonomous motion of humans in the scene. Um, I didn't have time to talk about this, but um, we're also like looking into this. We find this very exciting. Um, and um, self-supervision and three reasoning is becoming increasingly important. Um, so we saw this at, at the ECCB and at CBPR. You, you could see that the award papers were all incorporated. We need uh, basically codes that are controllable, but also we need codes that are um, compatible with learning. And the first part of the talk, I talked about more controllable codes. In the second part of the talk, I talked more about, about um, compatible with learning uh, representations. All right, so again, now is that we need perception algorithms that reason about the 3D world and not so much about pixels. And um, yeah, with this, I conclude my talk. And let me show you um, the link to all the software code and also, and yeah, I'm grateful to the generous um, funding that I received from the following um, agencies. And now I'll be very happy to answer questions. Well, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, are there any questions? Maybe. Um, there's a few questions on YouTube. I can start with one. <laughs> um, the latest one is philosophical in a sense. So you mentioned a bunch of pros and cons between implicit functional versus meshes. Um, what do you think is going to be the winner in the future? Yeah. <laughs> um... So you're asking me which one is going to prevail, you think? Yes. 
Well, I'm just reading the question on YouTube. Yeah. So um, actually, I think the some combination of both will prevail. I think l like learning, we're seeing that um, these implicit functions are very effective for learning. So I think this will, at least in the next two years, we're going to see lots of papers on this direct, in this direction. But I don't think meshes will disappear because they are compact. They are much more lightweight. So for example, like the problem with this implicit function is that you need, so, okay, so in the 90s, there were level sets, right? And people were very excited about level sets. Um, but still, you needed to store the level set in like some voxel grid. And this made it a little bit heavy. And now you need to store these implicit functions in a neural network, uh, which is still a little bit heavy. Um, so, I, I mean, maybe, maybe a comment from my side. So the neural network parameters are way, way more than a, a mesh. Yes, yes, exactly. So right. yeah, yeah, that, that's that's exactly the point. And on the other hand, like it's I'm sometimes really like amazed how well like it works for a variety of tasks. I haven't been able to produce like to predict meshes with details, for example, ever. So in that sense, um, yeah, it's hard it's hard to say, but I I don't see meshes disappearing completely. Not not at all. Okay, um, any other questions on Zoom? If so, just unmute yourself. Um, th there's many questions on YouTube. <laughs> I have to select probably a few. Um, how hard is it to learn new cloth, heavy jackets? How many samples is usually needed? So I think the question is asking like, how, how much can you channelize between the, um, the different shapes? Yeah. So, for example, um, to model the how clothing deforms with pose, we're talking about in the order of thousands, ten thousand poses is really already a lot. Actually, we learned it with much less. So, in the order of two thousand to three thousand poses for one material. Now, if we want to have a model that is sensitive to materials, then we're talking like it's more difficult to scale. Now, if you're asking about um, how many samples do you need to have a model that generalizes, generalizes across um, styles of a particular jacket? I think, again, like you, if you have or a thousand, you can get a pretty decent model already. Um, yeah. OK. Um, again, um, anybody on Zoom? Maybe I have a question too, right? I mean, so what do you think of the limits, right? I mean, you're talking a lot about like clothing. I mean, the, the challenge is obviously the high dimensionality, right? You, you're going to have to deal now with pose, shape, probably material eventually, right? Like deformation properties, stuff like that. So it's like an, the dimensionality is just really, really high. Um, yeah, I don't know. How do you think you can handle it? I mean, it's basically a really high dimensional space, but the data is very sparse in the space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the only solution is to make some assumptions. I mean, it depends on the application. If the application is to gener generate plausible humans, you have to make some assumptions. So for example, you can assume that um, even though like our shapes are not identical, if they are similar, then they are going to produce similar clothing deformations. You can assume that, for example, um, uh, yeah, so two different materials will share patterns of deformation so that you can learn a join model. Um, so I, that's, that's how I see it. Like you have to make some assumptions, which will result in less, not super realistic models, but in models that are at least plausible. Um, but yes, it is, a, it is a, a question. We already struggle to learn this model at, at CBPR because you start adding styles and shapes and poses and just generating the data is, is, is a pain. So yeah. Um, and another question on YouTube is like, how fast are things running um, in terms of when you're taking like point cloud as input and want to predict a full scene? Ah, um, good question. So for so for this IFnet, so I think um, like it's in the order of of one or two minutes to produce a reconstruction, but this can be like every point can be queried in, in parallel, right? So this can be much faster in practice. Um, 
but yeah, for the cur I think the current code, if you just use it, it takes about this one minute, maybe something like this. Um, did but I think it is possible to make it real time. Yeah. Did you try anything on on real 3D scans? Yes, these last examples are um, on on real 3D scans. What I showed. Um, I actually got another question. Like when you showed the the three D scans, right? You showed basically the completion scenario in, in the neural distance field work. So you, right. you you do have a partial input, right? And well, you have a point cloud as input. You want to get a surface as output. Right. right. Mm -hmm. How much is that like? Is that more like competing with well, Poisson surface reconstruction? So you just have a better surface fitting method, or is it also more like? Um, like an actual completion method where you hallucinate missing pieces, like you have like half a chair and you're missing, or you're more like interpolating yeah. between the points. It it can it yeah, I, I've definitely seen it like complete half a chair, half a human. Um, so it can it can do this. It needs to be trained for this. So if you mm -hmm. um, if you train on only point clouds that don't have these missing parts, then it will not do it. I mean, I, I'm not sure you had a paper right on on completing objects that are occluded. Um, it would be interesting to to see, like to compare. Uh, we didn't do that, but I've definitely seen it complete, like like really lots of missing data. It just needs to be trained with this, and then it, it does the job. So, so our experience, I can say a few things there. Maybe our experience was as soon as you're using implicit functions that are based on fully connected layers, like you just have an MLP, right? Mm -hmm. um, as soon as you do that, the generalizability is is, is not so high. So. Well, you can do some basic stuff, but it's mostly going to be interpolation, right? Um, which, which again, is very important for many things, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. like NERF, these guys, they're more, it's more interpolation. There's no generalization at this point. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, but so, whereas if you go for like explicit grids, like you have a volumetric grid, you're running 3D conf operators, then you're getting better in terms of generalizability, but you're missing local details. So you have kind of this this compromise you have to do, right? Right. Right. Um, but but um, so what I can say is that the general is it, it generalizes quite well. I mean, sometimes I'm quite surprised, and it's because we don't use a latent code for the whole scene or for a block of the scene. We just do 3D convolutions, extract deep features, and then send this to the decoder. And I think this this ends you end up with millions of data points because every pixel is one data point instead of one scene, and that's what brings you like much better general generalization. The yeah, way it's like sense. the same, right? That the same way like segmentic segmentation works so well because every pixel is a drain data point. This works well because every point now is a draining data point. And, and that's why OCNETs, for example, and the early models, uh, while they were very cool, they don't generalize very well because the latent code encodes the whole thing, right? If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes absolutely sense. Um, there's another very interesting question on YouTube. It's basically, um, what do you think about explicit physics simulation? Mm. Can you incorporate this, right? I mean, I mean, this is a high level question, right? It's basically, well, you, you have differential rendering now. Can we do stuff like differential physics simulation and stuff like this in the end? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So actually I moved away from this. I, I, <laughs> I was very excited about this, but um, maybe it's too hard for me. <laughs> so I'm still excited about it. I think it's a cool direction, actually. It is, it is very excited, but um, exciting. I, we tried to, we learned, um, I should say we tried to, because we didn't get so far. It was a secret of paper, but we learned the soft tissue, um, the, the parameters of a soft tissue, right? So we learned the parameters of the, um, of the simulator um, by, by basically simulation and compare, if you want, right? And so we learned how thick the layer should be and also the, the, the young modulus of the physics-based uh, model. Um, it is really, I mean, the good thing of a physics model is that then it, it, we know that um, it can generalize very well because it's very close to how real physics work. Um, but it's very difficult to fit to data. It's, it's, it's hard to get gradients. It's, um, you need to simulate until step until time like x right in order to compare and this makes it quite difficult i think but it's possible right i mean this um like recursive I model it's still a cool and, direction we just have to find a good way to well exactly. deal with the high with the high dimensionality of the physics simulation <laughs> exactly and and also with the yeah exactly it, it yeah and to me the main challenge is that in order to compare you need to run the simulation and steps forward, right? Yeah. And this, this is the is hard.
Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I think Can we have a question quickly. Maybe? Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, so uh, thanks for the talk, Gerard. Uh, actually, my question is kind of like a general, but uh, how far is the research to to match the the result from motion captures, like uh, in movies and so on? Yeah, I mean, I think it's getting very, very close. But if you ask like a movie product producer, will say no, I stick to motion capture because I mean. They, 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 they have the pipeline and they go, they want like perfect results. And you know, that sometimes they place like thousands of markers and they want every detailed right. Um, so it's, 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 it's gonna take some time until like movie producers adopt these markerless models. Um, but the quality is getting like, like very, 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 very good with just a few views actually. But, but I think it will, adoption will take a while just because they have all the pipelines and sometimes they don't care so much in spending um, quite a bit of money because in, in terms of the revenue they get from the movies is like maybe not so, um, so, so big, right? Okay, thanks. Oh, I cannot hear you, uh, Matthias, are you talking? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I think we have to... We have to probably cut it off here. Um, yeah. We can move to the to the private Zoom channel. Um, but yeah, it was really a pleasure. I hope there were many, many questions on YouTube. I couldn't go over all of them, but I, I tried my best to select a few. Um, yeah, OK. So, I mean, you, any any person can send send us an email, and then yeah. we will try to answer. <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Yes. Bye bye. <laughs>